How old do you know your state? Let's find out. Part two. Yeah. Part two. Spy. Huh? Spy. Yeah. I don't know German. Dos. Okay, so in the first episode, we talked about the beginning of the case of the boy in the box. We talked about the finding of the boy, the uh, autopsy, and the beginning stages of trying to f identify who this boy is. Yeah. So today, I am going to start with the theories. Um, and then the half resolution. Okay? Okay. Get into it? Do it. Okay. This case had gone cold. Nobody had came forward with any information that would lead to the identity of this boy and who had killed him. On November 4th, 1988, the boy in the box was exhumed to extract DNA samples, hoping future technology would be able to identify this boy. After the attempt, the authorities admitted that they had not been able to collect enough DNA to create a profile for him. They exhumed him again in 2000 from his teeth, but this attempt has failed as well. However, a third attempt in April 2001 had been successful. So, they exhumed him three times. So far. Yeah. The first time, I don't know where they took the DNA, but it wasn't enough. The second time, they took it from his teeth... And it wasn't enough. But in 2001, they took it from somewhere else and it was successful. Okay. With any unsolved mystery comes theories. One of these theories involved a foster home that was a little more than a mile away from where the boy was found. In 1960, an employee of the medical examiner's office had contacted a New Jersey psychic who told him to look for a house that apparently matched the foster home. A psychic was brought to the city and led the employee, Remington Bistro, straight to the house. He had attended the estate sale and had allegedly seen a bassinet similar to the one that the box housed, and blankets that resembled the one that the boy was wrapped in. His theory was that the child belonged to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the foster home, that the child was the result of the stepfather and stepdaughter who had let the boy die so that he would not be attached to an unwed mother. Hmm. Nice. This theory is mostly discredited, though, since police could, could not find enough evidence to support it. And this guy, Remington, he stuck to the story to his grave. Oh. Um. I mean, he stuck with it for a really long time. That's weird. It is weird, but I mean, it's not like the weirdest. Nah, yeah. It's plausible, I guess. Very plausible. The second theory came about in 2002 and was reported by a woman that just goes by the letter M. Um, the next paragraph about this woman's story contains uh, mentions of physical and sexual abuse. Disclaimer. She claimed that her abusive mother had bought the boy, named Jonathan, from his birth parents in the summer of 1954. She said that he had endured extreme physical and sexual abuse for two and a half years. Her mother allegedly killed the boy after he vomited in the tub in a fit of rage. She had haphazardly cut the boy's hair and then dumped him in the vacant lot. While getting ready to dump the body from the trunk, there was a passing motorist that had stopped to ask them if they needed help, but they ignored him and then he drove away. Police considered this story, but were troubled by M's story because she had a history of mental illness. They had interviewed the neighbors who had access to the house, and they said that, she, that the claims that the boy lived there were ridiculous. I don't know, but my f 
speculation in the last episode. Hmm. Kind of goes along that lines. Hmm. I mean, it would make sense why a child so young would have, like, a hernia. Right. Because he was sexually abused. And again, he was just not well taken care of, became a strain on parent figure, and she just couldn't take it. Right. So that's, that's a more plausible theory, I think. Right. I mean, the cops were really kind of into this, but they yeah. were... Her being a witness that in the court's eyes, because she had a mental illness, was not... I think they call it a stable witness. Right. Like... I guess they would think, oh, if they took this to court, then she would be easily discredited. Right, right. Which, I mean, I'm not saying that everybody with mental illness is not uh, able to stand up in court, but that that's just how court works sometimes. If you have anything wrong with you, they'll be like, they broke their thumb, they can't do this. Especially back then. Oh, yeah. They're throwing kids in... She's a, she's a woman with a mental illness. Right. And they're throwing children with mental illnesses in right. hospitals left and, left and right. Like, kids were thrown in there just because they had a stutter. Yeah. Just because of a stutter. Right. But they're in there with kids who, like, have severe anger issues and, like, you know, issues that would need... Um, professional treatment and yeah. care. And that was, uh, nothing that they needed. Nothing, yeah. 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 So, that, her theory came up in 2002. The story starts in 57. So, it's been a while. Right. Um, so. I can't I'm not gonna do the math. I can't do it. 44 years? 45 years. After this, there was nothing until November 30th, 2022. Uh, 20 years later, after her theory came out. Right. When the Philadelphia Police Department announced that they had identified the boy through genetic testing and investigative genetic genealogy. The boy had been identified as four-year-old Joseph Augustus Zarelli, born January 13th, 1953. His parents had been identified as Augustus Gus Zarelli and Mary Elizabeth Betsy Abel. Betsy would have been 21 when the boy was born. A relative to Betsy, who asked to be unnamed, had suggested that she put the boy up for adoption like she had done before with the daughter, but it remains unclear if she had actually put him up for adoption or not. The relative said that they do not think Betsy had anything to do with the mistreatment and the death of this boy. Which, I mean, obviously, when you come to cases like this, like, people who knew Ted Bundy was like, no. Right. He would never do that. But, I mean, I, it has to, I guess, show a little bit in someone's character to do something so awful. You yeah. Know? And, I don't know, I just realized this when I was doing this, but there was a handkerchief found. Yeah. And it had a G embroidered. Gus. Gus. Ah. Yeah. That's my speculation. There you go. Okay. But, yeah. It's a nice connector. Yeah. The police said that they do not know if the father knew of the birth of this child or the existence, as well as if... as well as how the two even knew each other. They were five years apart and lived relatively far away from each other. Gus Zarelli had died in 2014 at the age of 87. Which is pretty old yeah apparently they were a prominent family oh um i read in an article that it was a prominent family but i couldn't find anything else on him because it i feel like he would be the prominent family because there's more history on her um later on i go on to say that she works in like warehouses and everything so it's not like She's born into wealth. Right. 
or really has anything to fall back on. So she's working like blue collar jobs to support herself. So I think it would would have been him as the prominent figure that they were mentioning because they weren't together. They were never like a married couple or yeah. a or on paper a couple. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so that would kind of take his image down if he's, you know, Maybe. messing around with the impoverished. Right. Especially at that time trying to keep your your reputation up and yeah. it's like you're messing around with n- not a woman of the same social hierarchy as you. Oh yeah. That would probably What's the last name? Zarelli? Zarelli. That sounds familiar, no? Yeah. I didn't bother to go into it. But, yeah. Through genetic testing, they found out that those two were the parents, but could find no link between them. Which is why they think, maybe he doesn't even know that this child was born. Right? Which would make sense. I mean, if they met somewhere... Did the deed? Oops, I'm pregnant. Yeah. Like that happens all the time. Yeah. But back in the fifties, sure there were no safe abortions, or even affordable. They were doing them in back alleys. So. Right. I, I guess I should also say that these theories came before the discovery. I don't know if there's... I mean, the discovery was relatively recent, so there yeah. probably wasn't enough time to figure out the theories of what it is now because there are two parents that have been identified, but I, they don't really know. I mean, they, they don't even know the connection between the parents, let alone what happened to this child. So these theories were the theories when it was an ongoing investigation without anybody attached to him, just him as an individual small boy, unnamed. I mean... Which probably doesn't... At least there's a name to kind of give him. Yeah. I'll read on the next part, actually. On January 13th, 2023, some paternal relatives of Joseph attended the rededication of his headstone at Ivy Hill Cemetery in the Cedarbrook neighborhood of Philadelphia, which is where we went. Right. The relative said, quote, Our family was blindsided by this. We want to honor him by finding out his entire story. We want to put real closure to this story. Well, I'm glad that, you know, the family that didn't even know he existed is, like, totally trying to use their influence and honor him. Yeah. Yeah, so like I said earlier, Betsy worked at Crown Can Company, which I guess makes cans. Uh, probably like a, oh my god, what's it called? Like a factory. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah. Uh, and other warehouses on Erie Avenue. She died in 1991 after a prolonged illness, probably due to lung cancer, likely due to asbestos exposure. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you what time it was. Yeah. The death of little Joseph Augustus Zarelli was one that shook the city of Philadelphia. For more than 60 years, this boy laid under the headstone that read, America's Unknown Child. After multiple attempts at DNA extraction, they were able to collect enough and later go on to find his identity and his birth parents. He was finally given a headstone with his name on it, and he can now rest. That is the end of the story. That is a kind of solved mystery. For now. For now, yeah. A little bit. Yeah. I mean, for for me, I guess I would call it solved. We know what his name is. Yeah. The whole mystery was based on who is this kid. So that part of the story is is finally closed. Okay. Yeah. When I first heard about the story, it was unsolved. Now we need to figure out what happened to him. Yeah. And what sucks about that is you can you can identify somebody with all the advancing technology, but you can't go back in time. Right. And figure out how this happened and 
why yeah. this happened and like there's no there's no digital footprint right obviously what really sucks about it is since he's been dead for 60 plus years. 60 plus years the likelihood of getting justice for him is I mean it's probably already happened you know yeah. It's like this person's already long dead, probably. And I hope they're rotting in hell, man. Like. Yeah. Oh, his rededication to his uh, headstone was on his 70th birthday. Wow. Also, by the way, I forgot to say that. It was his 70th birthday. Which is crazy. That's where you can see stuff like four. But. <laughs> That's cool. Well, that was the end of part two. Yep. Um, sorry I had to make two parts. This was a pretty. I knew we were gonna talk a lot. That's why I cut it up into two parts. But it's a lot of talking points. Yeah. Uh. Um. Yeah. I'm glad that they finally found his name and gave him a proper headstone. Um. Ivy Hill Cemetery also houses Joe Frazier. If you would ever go to there, if you're a cemetery person um that was real cool his his whole block i guess if you want to call it is really really nice yeah um he's got events on there in case he was uh not dead if you know what i mean no yeah he's a i don't know if he just has a box on top of his grave or if he is in this box above ground i'm not too sure um but if you're ever going to visit Ivy Hill Cemetery, um, it's open to the public. You can just kind of go there. But the grave of this little boy is right at the front. And you can just go there and park. Yeah. If you're a cemetery person. If you're not, it's fine. But. We're weird. Yeah. So. But yeah, if you want to you wanna go visit it, give him a toy or something. Yeah, it's more in Cheltenham. If you're afraid of Philly. Cheltenham's not that much better. No, but it's also not city. Right. But, you know. Hey. Like, subscribe. Comment. I don't know. Sorry. Follow, follow all of our socials. I'll have them linked down below. Yeah, that. Do that. Yeah. And I really kind of want to make merch, but we've only got like 30 subscribers. Uh, dude, I, okay. 30 of you. If you have something haunted, um, be it your house, right? Or anything you can allow us to go to that you have the authority to allow us to go to to check it out give you some answers right we'll do it no cost to you none like there's no surcharge there's no like hourly rate there's nothing like that so it's free so uh, if you got something like that you can uh give us permission be more than grateful I'm not begging, I'm just begging. It's been slow. Well, thanks for watching. Yeah. Bye.